The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene, and hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure of As We See It, being recorded on Sunday, April 29th, 2012. This is show number 40, the big 4-0. In Boston, I'm Ed Jupin, and out in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, we have Fred Boaz in St. Louis, Missouri, where they just had some pretty nasty weather. We have Holly Hurley out in Los Angeles, Gene White. And also in the Boston area, Larry the Lobster. So how's everybody doing this week? Doing great, Ed. Doing, no complaints yep, here. Live through good. the storm. All right. Yeah, we'll get to that in a minute. I guess that might be our lead story here after we uh, discuss some lobster tales. Larry, what do we have for lobster tales this week? First lobster tale is a company in Taiwan makes dinner plates out of wheat so you can eat your plate. Number two tablecloths were meant to be used as towels with which dinner guests could wipe their hands and faces after eating. Number three, the world's oldest piece of chewing gum is over 9,000 years old. And number four, tourists visiting Iceland should know that tipping at a restaurant is insulting. Well, I'll make a quick comment on two of them. The first on number two, the tablecloth, I tell you what, I'll take all of you guys out to a very high-class five-star restaurant, but then we're all going to have to wipe our faces into the tablecloth and see if we get thrown out or not. Well, you know, when when you go to Somali and places just... No, he, said, he, is, no, he said that the original use was, it doesn't mean it's used now. <laughs> you know what, it makes so much more sense. I hate when things aren't functional. That's like having, like, what are those bed skirts? Like, that's not functional. You know, yeah, what's the use it, of it? Exactly. I think a tablecloth should be used to wipe your face. Why do we need a long tablecloth and then a separate napkin, which inevitably falls on the floor? Tablecloth actually makes a lot more sense. It stays on the table and you can lay it in your lap and it hits between you and your plate. I think that makes a lot of sense. And they send them out to be washed anyway. Yeah, exactly. They use them. Well, they wash them after every use. Linen tablecloths. Well, that goes along with all the etiquette that they're trying to teach people nowadays. You know, if, if, if everybody was doing it, a lot of it may have been done in places like restaurants where they didn't have to wash the tablecloth ever, ever, after every customer comes in that they, that they can reuse the linens as well. That's why the second, the second set of stuff would come out, like placemats and stuff. Yeah, because once you start blowing your nose into the tablecloth, they're not going to use it for the next customer. That's for well, sure. you never know. <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah I've, I've probably been in some restaurants that would do that. So. Yeah, we have. And then my second comment is on number four, the tipping at a restaurant. I know a bunch of Greeks, and Greeks also find that very insulting. Matter of fact, a Greek that I worked for several years back would not allow a tip jar in his business because he said that he didn't want customers thinking or just assuming that he wasn't paying his help enough so that the help had to put out a tip jar. So directly tied into him feeling insulted over his employees accepting tips. So that's, I know Greeks are like that as well. That's really interesting, Ed, because I lived in Astoria, you know, for all those years mm -hmm. there, and Astoria is very heavily Greek. Yes, it is. They always took my tips at restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> You know, speaking of uh, cultural differences, I think the plates made out of wheat, you know, I mean, the Somalians have been doing that for years. If you go to a Somalian restaurant where, surprisingly, they do have food, you actually eat Well, the, I hope they have food. Right? You actually, well, you know that the, when Harry met Sally joke, you know, you take yep. to an Ethiopian restaurant and uh, two empty plates and you're out of there. But they but they make their uh, their plates out of out of uh, edible material. It's a bread. See, at least you, so that's why the plates are empty, because you could just eat the plates. Yeah, there you go. You don't need anything on them. I think that makes a lot of sense. Saves on a dessert menu, too. That's your dessert. Yeah, the plate is your dessert. Well, I just thought of a great idea since plates in Taiwan are made out of wheat. Try and add some flavor to the plates like steak, chicken, spaghetti. Yeah, you may have spaghetti on your spaghetti, spaghetti flavored plate. I like Fred's idea. How about ice cream flavored plates? And that could be your dessert then. 
There you yeah. go. Or I got, a, I got a better idea since we were talking about Greeks anyway. Baklava flavored plates. And there you go. And you have <laughs> your baklava go. after your dinner. Excellent. Yes. Baklava is Greek. I thought it was Arabic. No, big Greek dessert. I think pretty much anything, uh, anywhere. Uh, yeah, that Middle Eastern area. Yeah. I mean, like that could, that, that actually, baklava spans a lot of countries and yeah. certain countries make it slightly differently. But On number three, how do they know that it's 9,000 years old? They actually do tests on the carbon chewing testing gum to, yeah. to determine that? Carbon yeah. testing? Yeah. They must have. And where was this, Larry? Where is it? Or what's the backstory behind it? doesn't say where they found it. Look it up, Blair. Come on. What is this? <laughs> you got the internet, are we, on the computer? I know. I don't know. That's not an acceptable answer in yeah. 2012. And, you just Google it, right? And, and you know we're going to ask these kind of questions about lobster tails. You really need to find a backstory behind them. <laughs> Yeah, for serious, Lair, Google it. Tell us what happened. Because you can't just bring it up. People want to know the story behind Talk it. Talk about an old Bazooka Joe. Yeah, oh my God. 9,000 years old? Wow. <laughs> that stuff would last 9,000 wow. years, though, that's for sure. I thought the stuff was 9,000 years old. Yeah. It's going now. <laughs> Maybe it well, is. Well, there's nothing true. in there that's really natural. Although, the piece that they found, it appears it was actually found that, well, they have, they've had several different uh, incidences, apparently, of finding the chewing gum. But these three rounds were found on the Swedish island of Aroost. And dental experts say that uh, it, was che it was chewed by a fully grown person. Uh, who still had Stone Age teeth and was possibly a teenager, which is hilarious because that, that means they thought that teenagers were fully grown back then, I guess. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Many more. Yeah. Okay, so the, the, they, they found a pair of 9,000-year-old teeth. That's what happened. Well, it said it had teeth marks in it. Okay, well, that's fine. Huh. Which is interesting. It had a, One of them actually had the imprints of teeth in it, and it was really well-preserved. That's fascinating. Wow. Isn't it? That's kind of crazy. It is. I don't know. That's. I mean, it makes sense, though. I feel like it's it's interesting because you know I've I've pretty much explored every kind of diet there is, and uh, they often talk about like the paleo diet and this and that, and you know I think people. The interesting thing is when I'm dieting, I always choose. I always uh, I always sort of crave something chewy because that's not something you really eat on your diet. You eat a lot of vegetables. You eat a lot of meat. Nothing really chewy, and so it makes sense. I guess humans have always kind of liked to chew. <laughs> wow. All right, well, let's chew on our first regular news story of the week. Okay. Well, you can call this regular. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I don't know how, how regular you want to call it. It's a little strange, but they've discovered four new species of crab that sport some wild colors, and they've been discovered in the Philippine island of Palawan. And the weirdest one they're showing a picture of is a, is a purple crab. It's purple with little red, bright red crimson claws. The reddish purple clads are the only variety that are endemic to the only one or a few islands, and the sea keeps them from spreading further. And it's interesting that you know that they just find this stuff now. Well, that they're just releasing it now. They probably the Philippines are probably Filipinos have probably known about this stuff for years. But I think well, it's interesting. What well, I want to know is that is when you cook these things, do they remain that the shell remain purple or turn red? Well, I mean, they're uh, they're endangered already, so it's uh, it, yeah. I guess we'll never know. I mean, if you cooked these and you told someone about it, they probably you know have you flowered by peanut. Well, we're gonna have to ask our resident lobster, Larry. Do you think they stay purple or do they turn red? You being of the crustacean type. <laughs> that's a, that's a good question. I don't know. You know, if you make well, Larry mad enough, he goes from red to purple. I'm pretty sure, right? There you go. Yeah, super lobster. Uh -huh. I heard of Super Mario. We have Super Lobster. No, it's it's interesting though that these are an endangered species because of the, of the rarity. So of course they are protected by law. But I just think it's interesting to have the different colored crabs and everybody in the world. I mean, mo most of your aquariums are going to want them, and I hope they don't release them. Cause I just like to see something. Else. I mean, leave them where they're at. You know, leave them where, that, that thing is interesting. That was an interesting article. Well, it's actually especially difficult, apparently, for them to survive because, you know, you mentioned that the salt water keeps them from spreading because, you know, the Philippines are obviously islands. Um, and these are freshwater crabs. They believe It believes that basically they were broken off years ago. Either some crab wandered out of the water and ended up in freshwater, and they, they have been – It did they say it took like 4,000 years for them to develop – and they're actually freshwater crabs, which is really, it's, it's not something else that that's what makes them so special. Besides their neon purple, I, I encourage those of you who are listening to this to go to Google, find this picture of this neon purple crab with orange claws, bright orange claws. I think they're orange because it's, it's crazy looking. 
I think we're going to have to update our lobster logo and turn him purple now, too. Oh, that's not Poor nice. No. Poor sweet lobster. Apparently, uh, there's an out-of-control European satellite hurtling through space these days. Tell us about it, Fred. This is sort of your area of expertise. I don't always understand the space talk. It's a ground-based radar station operated by Germany's, I can't even pronounce its name, Fraunhofer Institute for High Frequency Physics. See, so you can pronounce it. You did good. I, I did as good as I could. But it's, uh, it's, it, this thing is out of control. They're, what they want to do is they want to get up there and they want to try to use a piece of equipment to try and uh, – the United States, we're trying to get – using another, another satellite, from what I understand, to try and get in there and rescue this thing and try and fix it. They lost, they lost uh, sight of it, and the European Space Station was able to get a picture of it. It's still intact, and they're trying to see if they can get this thing – I mean, it would be great. It would be great if they can use the thing for rescuing doing a rogue satellite or something up in space rather than having the thing burn up or having a blow it up. I mean, yeah, you're talking billions of dollars of technology. Yeah, but aren't they right now trying to figure out if it's going to come crashing into us first? Come crashing into something, but if, they're, if they're they don't get to, to it in time, yeah. If they don't get to it in time, it's going to wind up hitting the Earth's atmosphere and wind up burning up in space. The idea is to keep this thing going, but they have to align the solar panels if they're out of alignment. And if they can't get the signals out to it, they have to get somebody up there or get something up there to try and, to try and realign the solar panels to get power back into the batteries. It'll be interesting to see what they do. After all the millions of the billions of dollars being spent on space programs all over the world, it's about time we did that. We did something to do this right. True anyway. story. Yeah, well, there's there's more interesting stuff out there that goes on out there. Apparently, a, this woman in China. It's a it's a story that all I gotta say is ouch, because okay. apparently. Well, this is messed up because she she this she's 42 years old. She pulls her scooter up outside of her kids school and this guy won't let her park her scooter in front of his his establishment he has a shop there and so she basically first she calls her brother and her husband to beat the guy up then in the middle of the fight she grabs his balls squeezes them until she kills him this yes, I mean, the guy is just trying to keep people from parking in front of his store which whether or not you agree with that this is in front of a school this woman's obviously a lunatic when, and it's more, it's in front of her kids as well. That's what kills me. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, Holly did say she grabbed his balls. More importantly, it's in front of an elementary school in the Mayland District. Like Holly said, you're going to pick up her child, and when she tried to park her school in front of the shop, she was rejected by the 42-year-old male shop owner. This woman should be put under the jail forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and never see the light of day. I'm sorry. What she did was, 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 was unconscionable by anybody's standards. Police did take her away. The man is immediately rushed to the hospital where he died. What do you call it? First degree murder or what? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you can't call it first degree, right? Because there was no premeditation. She obviously just went crazy and then did this. Although the <laughs> fact that she called her uh, brother and her, her, whoever the other guy was, I can't even remember, her husband to come and fight this guy. I don't know. I, they may be able to make a case for it, but that's, that's messed up. I mean, that woman should be, she should be locked away forever and ever. I mean, it's because you don't, don't do that. And these people have to understand that you just don't do this kind of stuff. And, you know, it's, I read this article and I, it's a short little piece has pictures of the shop and doesn't have pictures of her, but she should just be taken out and just slapped. I mean, that, that's just crazy. Because you, the guy won't let you park your scooter in front of his store. You, you wind up committing murder. If I was on the jury in that, she'd be, she'd be gone for everybody's lifetime. This is in China, and I'm not as familiar with uh, Haiku City as I am. You know, I mean, obviously, I only went to, I only was there for two weeks, and I only got to go to, like, Beijing, Hangzhou, and Shanghai, the really big, you know, first-tier players. But, I mean, China doesn't put up with stuff like this. You know what I mean? Like, this is... Oh, I think she's going to fry. Yeah. Uh, she does. I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't like that people getting killed or whatever but this woman's obviously violent and dangerous i mean she's a danger to herself and everyone around her and does china have the same kind of laws as the mid-east like if somebody does something like that they stone them or is that different they different have culture? come a long way since and i'm not very familiar with their legal process i mean singapore obviously is probably the closest Asian Asian country, and they have some crazy laws and stuff. But China is actually, they're very utilitarian with their laws. I, I would find it hard to believe 
I mean, I don't know exactly what the punishment is. I didn't plan on kin- killing anyone while I was there. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I just wanted to make him suffer. Ugh. Well, she, he's, that poor guy suffered. That's for darn sure. Now, sure. Holly, we got something coming in from your neck of the woods. Yes, actually, and not any more joyful, I'm afraid. Last night, we had crazy tornadoes, hail, terrible storms, and... Uh, Should have stayed in Boston. There was right. <laughs> like we didn't have that when I was there. Come on. But the Cardinals uh, that had a tent up at Kilroy's, which is a bar, and the tent that was set up near the rear of it actually got blown away at 50 miles an hour. Uh, the winds apparently got up way past that last night. And uh, 100 people were injured and one was killed and 16 were taken to the hospital. I mean, they were, they were drinking in a 50 mile an hour wind in a tent. It says there were a hundred. There, it says up to 150 fans may have been under the tent at the time, which I just think is crazy because we heard the sirens here. Everyone I knew was in their basement. Even people who lived in apartments in U City were in their basement. Uh, U City's University City. It's over by school. Obviously, you know every town kind of has that area. It's like Austin in Boston. You know, I mean, even people who were in their uh, apartment buildings ended up in their basement. So I, I just think it's crazy that these people were out in a tent. And eventually the tent actually got stuck on a railroad tessel, which there's a photo of it blowing over the railroad tracks. And you're just thinking, this is idiotic. Somebody take that shit down. Pardon my language. Well, somebody slapped these people for, for having to be out there drinking during a, thor- a thunderstorm. There's no way that they didn't know the storm was coming. Yet they still went in there. They started to go in, started to drink, started to get drunk, and somebody got killed. And you know they're going to be lawsuits against the, law- against the St. Louis Cardinals for it. Well, the tent had been had received a city permit, and of course, everyone knew that there were thunderstorms. And thunderstorms are one thing. I mean, the day before the half marathon, the go marathon that John and I ran, we did the half. We did not do the full this time. There was a 5K the day before, and you know, everybody came out, and it's just you know, weather's unpredictable. You don't know if it may miss you by a few feet or something. But this, so people knew there were going to be thunderstorms, but the tornadoes, I think, were a surprise. And it was, I mean, it was widespread, it was, it was penetrating, it was a lot of tornadoes, it was kind of a mess. But I, I, I understand why the tent was there, I understand that people thought that they could drink, I don't understand why when the sirens went off, they stayed in the tent. That's what I don't understand. And, of course, there's an investigation pending, so we can update it that Well, there's going to be. There better be an investigation pending because, I mean, there are, there are people, especially when they're involved with alcohol and drinking. I have nothing against drinking. We've all drunk. We've all had our drinks. They're going to sit there and risk their lives for a few beers. I mean, this goes on all the time at, at, at any kind, sporting events, parties. People are getting drunk. They're getting killed. The venue winds up getting sued because they didn't provide adequate protection you know, there got to be a point. Well, look at say, look at a year ago. I believe Holly, it was in Texas where uh, the country band Sugarland was about to go on stage for a concert, and That's a tornado right. or a huge thunderstorm went through, and it knocked down the stage and all. And again, at least one person, if not more, got killed and all. And everybody is being named in a lawsuit in that, as well as the uh, band Sugarland. Which, of you know, course, they could have had nothing. They no, could've... absolutely. But, you know, that's how lawsuits go. You just name everybody that was involved that day. But so that just comes to mind. That took place only about a year ago. Yeah, yeah I, had, I had totally forgotten about that. Yeah, the difference is, though, that, that, that was a stage. It wasn't a, it wasn't a tent. And people, these people, even if you're in a tent, you're still basically outside. You're protected all, you're protected from the elements, but when those sirens go off, you get your ass out of the tent, you stop drinking, and you find shelter. These people should be, I mean, nobody wants to be held culpable for the decisions that they make when they involve alcohol. I mean, a guy will drive down the street, hit four people, and say, oh, I was drunk at the time. I didn't know what I was doing. Well, you know something? You shouldn't have been drinking. I mean, I don't drink and drive. I don't want to have the responsibility of doing it. But... And, you know, I don't want to sound like a Pollyanna or a teetotaler because Ed will tell you I'm not and I'll tell you he's not. But I don't drink and drive. I don't do – I mean, I'll go to a place and if it starts going, man, I'm out of there. I don't want to get hurt. I don't need to get killed. You can't predict the weather, but these people should have known better. 
can't argue with that, especially that close to the Cardinal Stadium. You've got to experience this kind of stuff all the time because people here, well, you guys experience it with the Red Sox. People here are emphatic about their team. They're enthusiastic. They're willing to be out in almost any kind of weather. And the businesses around the area have to know how to handle that. So that just, that just, I think, is the craziest thing ever. And, of course, this actually went out on CNN International, and I thought it was so funny because on the story they said this happened last night, and that was while the storms were still here in St. Louis, you know, and it's tomorrow on the story, which I thought was very interesting because oh. we were still in the middle of the storm. You and know. it brought a lot of hail as well as tornadoes, correct? Yes, tons of hail, tons of really large hail. I sent you guys a couple photos, and... Those of you at home can feel free to Google some photos. There were there was huge hail, there was thunder, lightning, tornadoes. I mean, it was it was crazy. It was quite a mess out here last night. It, I was just glad that I'm one of the lame people who spend their Saturday nights at home. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and didn't only spend it at home, went down into the basement. Exactly, in my house with a basement where I could take my dog and my husband. It was very nice. <laughs> Glad everybody's safe there in St. Louis, Holly, and be forewarned, listen to those sirens. They, they mean something's up when you hear a siren. Well, this week we're going to start a new feature on our show. It's called The Lobster Stumps the Announcer. Larry and Gene, take it away, guys, and first, why don't you explain to us what this is going to be all about? I just figure it's going to be mostly about little music trivia pertaining to certain songs recorded way back when. Oh, well, you're talking to the right guy then, if you want to go way back when. <laughs> well, Come on, she's not that old. I didn't <laughs> say that. Fuzula, yeah. Okay. okay, well, here goes. My question is, name the group that recorded this song, All the Young Dudes. Come on, you know that one, Gene. Well, I hope he knows that, because I certainly don't. It is, in fact, Mutt the Hoople. You got it. Don't and tell me you. Don't tell me you actually knew that. Yes, I did. I, knew that. I never heard I of the. the I never heard of the, of the song or the band. I just want to know what from, It was actually from 1972, and a little piece of trivia on that. David Bowie. David Bowie actually was the producer, played rhythm guitar, and also did backing vocals for that song. And Isn't what's that, the name of it? Yeah. And what's the name of the band? Mott, M O T T. The Hoople, H O O P L E. Mott the Hoople from 1972. Yeah, I guess, I guess you probably didn't listen to a lot of that music like I did. I listened to a ton of music in 1972, but I just don't recall that. I guess not well. <laughs> Wait, does this, go back okay, to the does this go back to the conversation that you guys had about not remembering the 60s, Ed? Uh, there you go, yeah. Well, th I guess we don't remember the early 70s either. Not kind of the wash. I have another question pertaining to a song about... Oh, let's do it. Since this is our first Larry Stumps okay. the Announcer, let's go with another one. This does. This pertains to a song recorded by Steppenwolf, and this is the reason why this particular song was recorded. The song that was recorded by Steppenwolf is Magic Carpet Ride. I know the reason why it was recorded, but I'm wondering if Gene knows the reason why. To make money! Okay, stump the announcer. The reason why it was recorded is well, because... Well, you did not. You've got to let him answer first. Okay, I'll go ahead and answer. answer. I'll tell you what, Larry. You got me stumped on that one. Up, uh, stump, uh, uh, stump the announcer. <laughs> we have our first loser. Okay, and the reason why Magic Carpet Ride is recorded, or was recorded by Steppenwolf, is because a member of the group just bought a new stereo and was lying on his carpet listening to it. A stereo? You mean yeah, records? Yeah. What's a stereo? No, a, no, a stereo system. I know, Larry, I know. <laughs> if there are any kids listening, they're not, they're not going to have any idea what that even is. Yeah, a stereo? What's a stereo? And if you remember uh, Jersey City, Peter Noon, this is what CDs looked like in the 60s. Yep, that's right. <laughs> yeah, why, don't, why don't you, oh, CDs. No, the kids don't know what CDs look like. All they buy is MP3s. That's CDs true. Yeah, old. kids now don't even know what CDs look like. Exactly. That's like, well, you might as well ask them if they remember the boombox. Ask people, well, vinyl's coming back. Vinyl? What the hell's vinyl? All right, so Gene, uh, who was our new segment featured by this week? Lobster Stumps the Announcer is brought to you by 
GMM Radio, playing the best songs ever recorded from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s, heard on Live 365. Tune in. What a coincidence. So that's going to be our new recurring feature now, and we'll see uh, if the lobster can stump the announcer again next week. Scores one and one, then. Yes, it is. One to one. So you'll have to tune back in next week to see if anybody takes the lead in the little contest. <laughs> yeah. So here's one that ought to get Larry riled up. Apparently, there is an illegal immigrant. His name is Jose Manuel Godinez Sampiero, or Samperio, sorry, who was brought to the United States from Mexico when he was nine years old, and he graduated valedictorian of his class. He's an Eagle Scout. He completed college and law school and passed the state bar exam. And now the question is, can an illegal immigrant become a lawyer? No. No way. Really? That's right. So tell me why. Because he's an undocumented immigrant. If you want to be a, if you want to work as a lawyer, you have to play by the rules. Fred. Well, no, my my thing is this, and I understand that he had no choice in coming here with his parents from uh, nine years old. But during the time he went to high school, went to college, went to law school, took the bar exam, he never took the time to bother to spend the time to go for his citizenship. That's not now, true tried multiple times. He's still trying to get his citizenship. That's a big part of this case. Well, his, his as far as I'm concerned... Then I know, think it should be predicated on that. You you could pass the bar and whatnot and they could say, okay, well, you know, yes, you'll, you'll be admitted to the bar once you're a U.S. citizen. And that's fair. Because otherwise, again, it goes back to rewarding to rewarding Ill, uh, an illegal act. Now, he didn't commit it himself. I understand that. He was born here at nine years old. Yeah, and that's why I agree with uh, not stopping him from joining the bar. It, admit him, you know, or um, basically like a... Um, conditional. Conditional. You know, say, yes, okay, you know, you passed your test, you did your schooling, you're accepted into the bar, but you can't practice law. That would, I be the best way to describe it then you can't practice law until you become a citizen and that and and that's fair because you got to remember and i tried to try to get this through to some of the people i know when my parents came here they went through the system well my father day and my mother was born here they got so many people out there who come in they go to five years they go the eighteen thousand interviews they finally get their citizenship they get the paper and they're every time we allow someone who has not gone through the steps and I the steps being changed it, it changed if you have to but when you do this you're rewarding someone for breaking the law and it's a slap in the face to all the immigrants that took the time to do it now you know he doesn't even have a green card as a foreign alien as a resident alien to practice to have a business license in this country I mean he's here illegally and when you was words undocumented alien what it's still illegal and whether you're Mexican, whether you're African American, whether you're Kenyan, doesn't matter. If you're here illegally, you should not be given the op the, the same rewards as someone who's playing by the rules as, okay. as, as, as someone who you know, did it. Listen, listen, you guys, I understand where you're coming from with this, but here's the problem. He went all the way through high school was a valedictorian. He went through the Boy Scouts, became an Eagle Scout. He was allowed into and to graduate college. They should have caught this sooner, first of all. All the documents were there. He's been trying to get citizenship. Listen, if you're going to let a kid become valedictorian of his college or valedictorian of his high school, go to college, go to law school, and take the bar exam, then you should allow him to become a lawyer. Well, what, you should what's, just the, him what's the hang up with his citizenship then? Yeah, that's what I'm wondering. That's because what the, the, obviously this he's is. obviously, and I'm going to call him a kid. I don't even know how old he is, but obviously this kid is bright and intelligent yeah. since he's gone through all of this, being valedictorian, and he's gone to, gone to and graduated from law school. All right, so he's not an ignoramus. This kid's intelligent. So where's the hang-up then on him getting his citizenship? The, the, hang up, the, the test hang is up. not that difficult. 
the hang up may be with INS and their rules because his, and it may be and I don't again I don't know so I'm I'm kind of guessing here but it might be because his parents are here illegally that they're not allowing him to have citizenship retroactive which I think is wrong right well but I mean, I, again he, he yeah into, you know if he walks in and says, look I'm here I've been here since I've been nine years old and and is willing to spend the time and streamline so you just the you just hit the nail on the head though he's been here since he was nine years old I and it think wasn't his fault. No, but I He's think 35. I think I'm, that's 26 years they've let him yeah. go. They've let him go with. This. I think so I'm going to let him stay here for 26 years. Just give the kid a citizenship already. Either deport him. You or don't. Give, no, you don't give no, anybody. Don't give. I think unfortunately the big problem is that he wasn't born here. Obviously, and we've talked about this on as we see it before. Even if his parents came here illegally and then he was born here, he's automatically a citizen here. He was not born here. He was brought here illegally by his parents. I'm I'm willing to guess that that's where the hang-up is. You know, he wasn't born here. He was born in another country and came here illegally. So I'm sure that's where this is being hung up. It would seem like the common sense thing to me that that's where the problem is. There need to be provisions made for certain things. I mean, again, the kid is not an ignoramus, like you said. He bid pass and all this. And... So he is a valued member of society. The problem is, and it may be an INS hang-up with, again, going back to his parents. Now, do we, you know, do we boot everybody out and say, okay, fine, you guys got to come back in? My thing would be, all right, the kid wants citizenship. He wants to practice law. So you and, and let this kid in, in some you fast way, track it. Uh, you know, there there are get him the citizenship. Yeah. As quickly as possible, don't keep turning the kid down. Right, there's extenuating keep... circumstances to every case. And this case obviously has a bunch of extenuating circumstances. The Whoever is his local senator or congressman or something should be fast-tracking this case to get him his citizenship yeah, as soon as possible. However, so. does, that no. also creates a problem, though, with other people that are in the same position that may not be this kid. So it's got to be done case by case and cannot just say, well, it, it's going to happen for everyone. If you can show certain things, okay, fine. But you got kids, like, like we said, that are born here that are granted American citizenship automatically, which may or may not be a good thing. Once they're here, you know, what do you do with these kids? It's almost the same thing. And, you know, you can't just grant everybody citizenship. You can't just streamline everybody. But what you do is you, say, you take it case by case. Okay, maybe you, t you tell the parents, okay, fine. You're going to pay a fine of whatever it is, but we're going to give you a kid to citizenship and, and let it go with that. Well, Jane? well and here, here's the thing is that, you know, being in business school, we have at our business school over 30% internationals. And these kids have a much harder time finding jobs. And when they do find jobs, they have to find someone who will sponsor them here in the United States. But that happens every day for, for people who we consider specially skilled, gifted, valuable to the country. I think this kid has proven that a hundred times over. Like, get, give him what he needs to work here because he's grown up here. He doesn't know anything That's else. That's why I'm saying in his no, particular no. case, this should be fast-tracked. I don't know yeah. what the problem is. No, well, Gene, what were you going to say? Basically, you're going to say the same thing. I mean, the kid, as has been reiterated a couple of times, right? he's not stupid. He's very smart. Very intelligent. Been here since so, he was nine years old. Yeah, been here since he was nine years old. I mean, he's proven himself in a in a in a, in a way that is valuable to what he does. So they should just let him do his citizenship and let him go on with his life. See, the idea is this: you don't want to give anybody anything. You don't want to see the problem we have. Part of the problem we're having with our immigration system is we give our citizenship away like it's candy. You don't have to earn it. Just because yeah, you're if he passes a test. Yeah, I'm saying let him earn it. Just fast track yeah. the paperwork. Yeah, fast, Obviously, the paperwork is caught hold up on, in red tape. Whoa, 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 you guys are missing my point. Anytime someone's born in this country, we grant them citizenship. Right. Now, that creates a pro some part of the problem we're having. Is that once you have a you grant a citizenship to a child, you cannot deport the parents right. because you're deporting the parents right now. But what if and if people are here illegally, that his parents, that's their problem. The, it should never have happened 30, 26 years ago. Okay, they've been here. Part of the problem with this kid is different. But if you go in and you take and part of the problem, if you give it away, it's not appreciated. People need to earn their citizenship, and this kid has earned it. 
He's earned it tenfold by becoming valedictorian, by Obviously. actually going to college, yeah. doing well on the doing well on the bar exam, not just being number. No, four I, I think well, we I think you know. we are in agreement with you, Fred. We're we're just saying that this case is apparently caught up in the red tape, and that's what I mean. I I'm not going to speak for everybody. That's what I mean by fast track. A yeah, senator or a congressman I, could look at this case. Hold on one second, Larry, and then yeah, I know we got to let you in, and. A senator or congressman in his district should say, look, you know, this is obviously caught up in a bunch of red tape. This kid's certainly deserves citizenship. Look, you know, he's a prominent, outstanding citizen, in air quotes, already of this country. Let's fast track this paperwork so it, it could get processed. Larry? I was just going to say, if he wants a citizenship, let him go through the system like everyone else. No fast tracking it, because if they fast track it for him, then all the illegals are going to want it. Well, first of all, the immigration laws need to be changed. It's not five years and 800 interviews. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just insane. I know somebody went through it, was here for five years, and literally had to go to immigration over 20 times, ask the same questions over 20 times just to, to get citizenship, and that's insane. It should there because I know when people came through Ellis Island, they were some of them were granted citizenship, some of them weren't right there on the spot. My father got his citizenship by joining the U.S. Army. So there are ways of fast tracking it. You need to get if the people want citizenship, get it to them, but get it to them within six or eight months so that they can say, "Hey, I've earned it." Ask them a couple questions, make sure that they really want it, and. You know, give them their loyalty oath and off they go instead of five years. That's insane. No, I, I agree with that point, actually, Fred. And I think the problem is, is that not only is our process completely difficult, and I understand why that it became that way, but I think it really penalizes those who contribute to our society. I think this is a case of that. Perfect. But I also, and I hate to say it this way, but I also think that Larry's right. And one of the things that makes this case so difficult is this guy should have had citizenship before he encountered this problem. Now it's going to be one of these things where every person who wants to become a lawyer, like Larry said, or every person who wants to stay here is going to say, well, you gave it to that one guy because he was becoming a lawyer. Why didn't you? Why don't you give it to me? Well, yeah, and that's what Fred said way back at the beginning. If we remember, Fred said, why didn't this kid start pursuing his citizenship? And again, we're just talking out of our hats. We're not quoting statistics here. But just why for conversation's sake, didn't this kid start pursuing citizenship back in grade school or high school or college, even, you know, his pre-law days. And then through the time he went and studied for his bar and got to the point where he's at now, it shouldn't take this long to still not have his citizenship. So that's why I'm saying this is obviously hung up in some kind of red tape somewhere where he needs, he literally needs a politician to step in. Oh, we really don't know. We and, really don't know when he started trying to get it either. Because you got to remember. Well, if he started, a, if he started a month ago, what the hell made him wait okay. so long? The, no, no, the problem is, is he's been, he's apparently been petitioning for citizenship pretty much his whole life. Like, well, that's what I don't get. You yeah. know, that's why some, it, it that's why somebody needs to jump in. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's got to be something going That's on. That's why a politician okay. needs to jump in and get this. I mean, you got to remember, you're talking four years of high school, four years of college, and then law school, pre-law. That's almost 12 years. Yeah. If this kid hadn't gotten citizenship for 12 years, he didn't start then 12 years ago because it's a, it's a five-year. But now, because I'm telling you, more than likely, the part of the problem may be retroactive to his parents being here illegally. And that's, you know, because... If you grant him citizenship, what do you do with the parents? And that, that, that's a whole other issue. But get this kid what he needs. Even get him a, a, a resident alien card temporarily. Get him something so he can start practicing law. I like it. And I like that you guys started it. No. That's, that's, this, is, this is nice. I like, we grow on this show. Well, right now it should be no until something can be done. But get, it, get, get that no changed to a yes by taking care of the problem that's there. I'll accept that. Now, I, I would like for you to introduce this next story, Fred, so that I can give an unprecedented event on As We See It, as we enter into entertainment news. Uh-oh. Or maybe we'll call this political Ooh. news. How about, how about political entertainment news or something like that? Uh, yeah, politi this, is, this is entertaining political news. That's what this is. <laughs> I see a new mayor on the horizon. Oh, Jesus. All right, go for it. Come on, Fred. I'm ready. I'm ready. I got it built up. Right, now you haven't made the announcement yet. No, you're going to make the announcement. You're going to do I'm it. Gonna do, I'm going to do it. Kardashian may be running for mayor of Glendale, California. Wait, 
Say it again so that everybody can hear the whole the Kim whole thing here. Kardashian. No, no, from the top. I want him to hear. I want him to hear the first part. You keep inter You keep c cutting over me with the first words. This is important. I want them to hear every word. Kim Kardashian has been at a White House dinner, and it was said that she may run for mayor of California. <laughs> oh, Holly said, "Who cares about an entertainment person?" Who cares? Why would Kim Kardashian be considered to run for anything except maybe more on in a month? Best butt. Best butt of the month. Kim Kardashian could be best butt. She could run for that. Hey, Gene, you're right down the road from Glendale, California. What do you think? No way, no how. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. I would have voted for Mary, whatever her name was. She was a porn star that was running for governor of California. I would have voted for her first before I vote for Kim Kardashian. Please. Because she got paid for her sex tape. Yes. <laughs> exactly. That's smart business. That's just NBA 101, man. Oh, Jesus. This is, and the thing about it is, is I think that Kardashians are incredibly entertaining. I yep, think sure. they, they have been very smart about staying in the public eye. Nobody would, we've talked about this before, nobody would have thought that the daughter of OJ's lawyer would have become an international superstar based on being obscene. I can see sports. it now. They're going to set up cameras in City Hall and they're going to turn it into a reality series. Oh, Jesus. <clears throat> I mean, the money making for Ryan Seacrest, this is like the best news of the year. But for the rest of us, this is just a horrifying turn of events. These, these girls are great at business. Don't get me wrong. They're doing their family, or maybe it's just Chris Jenner alone. I don't know. Is doing a great job at staying in the public eye. Maybe it's because Seacrest is a genius. I don't know. They have nothing else to do but stay in a family eye. They have no life other than that. Right, but you know they don't have to. No, they have to. It's called the adulation of it. They, a lot of these people can't survive and can't live without being, look look at me, look at me, look what I'm doing, look at me. I mean, there's a, I've met a lot, Ed and I have both met a lot of people like that where they have to be in the spotlight or they don't feel that they're worth anything. And I'm sorry, but oh, I have no missing, Kardashians at all. No, you're missing my point here, Fred. They don't have to do anything else because we are watching them. Maybe no, it's what they need, but they don't have to do anything else because America and the rest of the world are watching them. We no. stop watching, they stop mattering. Exactly. We boycott them, and it, it's more effective that way. I don't know. I don't watch them, and they're not disappearing. I don't watch them, and they're still bothering me. Yes, Ed, and I mean, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to pull the age card here. People younger than me are watching them. Khloe Kardashian uh, cost $2,400 a tweet to endorse your product in 140 characters. These people are making tons of money doing, as you said, Fred, what they'd be doing anyway because of their personalities. Hell, I'll endorse your product for 10 bucks if it goes to BaseNet. That's right. You can endorse your product for, for less than $10 on BaseNet. Tell us what you want. Give us some money. We'll, we'll talk about you on the show. And we hit almost as many people as Khloe Kardashian hits per tweet. There you go. <laughs> oh, this is just terrifying. That, ladies and gentlemen, is known as a shameless plug. Yeah, I don't even, I don't even know where to go from here. I don't How know. about more entertainment news? Well, the rest of our entertainment news is all really sad. We've only got we got a couple of obits this week. I mean, I'm sure other things happened in entertainment news. And Gene gets to do the first one. A couple of days ago, we lost Peter Pete Fornatel. He was a uh, New York City disc jockey, considered a pioneer of FM radio and rock, actually, who played an important role in progressive rock and also FM broadcasting. He broadcasted uh, progressive rock and long album tracks, which was un kind of unheard of. And he was noted for introducing a musical alternative to Top 40 AM radio in New York in the late 1960s and early 70s. He was actually the first American to interview Elton John out of all the things that he's done with his life. And I guess he's going to be sorely missed. I mean, he was one of the pioneer broadcasters that I remember listening to as a kid and kind of wanted it to be a broadcast because of him, Don Imus, all those guys. You know, it's sad. You've better miss Pat St. John. You better mention Dick Summer. Of course. Dick Summer. <laughs> Dick Summer. 
Scott Mione. Cousin Brucey. Let's not forget Cousin Brucey. <laughs> All I mean, those guys. The, the and, was, and Pete was mostly in the, in the heyday of his career on WNEW, correct? Correct, yeah. 1027. Yeah. And I remember Pete, though, playing. Uh, he used to play what people don't realize when he was playing the singles. He very rarely played the top 40. He always played the flip sides. And they didn't have playlists, right, Fred? Uh, Gene? No, they didn't have playlists back then. No. Pete always played. And he would always explain a lot about the history of the song he played and a lot of like what Gene was doing today with the uh, stuff. And it, 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 it was always a pleasure to listen to Pete. He'll always be remembered. Him, Scott Muni, Pat St. John, the whole crew over there. Yeah, they're all gone now. They sure are. Shows you how dated we are. Well, I mean, I don't want to date myself, but I guess we could move on to the second obit of the week. Chris Etheridge from the Flying Burritos, the Flying Burrito Brothers. Now, of course, you know, I know of Chris Etheridge because I'm a big Willie Nelson fan, and he toured with Willie Nelson. Uh, and if you've ever heard Whiskey River, I mean, it's one of the best recorded tunes out there. He was 65, and he had some complications from pancreatic cancer. People who are familiar with the Burritos know they were a country rock uh, band co-founded with Graham Parsons, and they were you know, known for their 1969 album, The Gilded Palace of Sin, and they were very, he, he actually left the band before their next album, Burrito Deluxe, but they were very popular in the same, around the same time period as Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, basically all the big, all the big guys in that genre, Johnny Cash can be included in there if you like that sort of thing, and so, uh, so this is, this is a pretty devastating week for uh, entertainment deaths, I would say. Hey, Holly, and I asked Ed a question on this. Do you have any idea if he was uh, related to Melissa Etheridge? Alas, no. <laughs> All of that for that simple All answer. Effort. No. <laughs> 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 oh, well, I guess that's if there's nothing else, all of this talk about bur burritos is making me a little hungry. Yeah, that's where I'm going next. So, from Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. And from the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. From St. Louis, Missouri, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. From Los Angeles, California, I'm Gene White. Reminder just to make sure you listen to GMM Radio for all the best songs ever recorded from the 50s, 60s, 70s, and early 80s. Thanks for joining us as we see it today, and have a wonderful week. We'll see you next time. <laughs>